Bienvenidos, buenas noches tengan todos ustedes. Perhaps uh, if you are watching this right now, you are listening in English, in Spanish, don't worry. We will be having the rest of the show in English because we have a very special and very talented guest uh, with us. Uh, we have already the, the honor to be talking with him before in Churros in Palomitas, but right now we have him in uh, the, the show that everybody loves because we talk about comics and he is Mark Russell. How are you doing, Mark? Doing good. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure for us to to having you uh, with us in uh, in here. Thanks once again for accepting the invitation. And well, uh, you guys know the rest of the crew. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Gilberto, alias Nightboy. Hi, how are you? Welcome, everybody. All right, and we have also uh, Good Rick, also known as Psicotropico. Hey, a pleasure to be here with Mark. And last but not least, we have uh, Daniel Villamil, also known as uh, El Wookie. Hi, good night. All right, so uh, uh, we are going to talk about some of the projects that uh, have been released. And, uh, well, uh, we have also been recommending uh, some of your titles, uh, of your previous titles, uh, Mark. I believe that even from the Flintstones, and, well, uh, we have talked about that a little bit before. And then we have the really nice surprise of some of the upcoming titles that the, that we are going to be released, or, or even one that was released last week, uh, one of those uh, fascinating crossovers with Hanna Barbera and the DC comic characters. So uh, why don't we start talking about uh, where did the idea uh, to mix uh, Green Lantern, Jon Stewart with uh, Huckleberry Hound uh, came from? Well, that came from the, uh, the editor, Jim Chadwick, who works at DC. Uh, he approached me uh, about writing a crossover, and to me it was a golden opportunity because it gave me a chance to sort of put an epilogue on to the Huckleberry Hound character I had introduced in uh, the Staglepuss series. So I was on board, and when he said he wanted it set in 1971 with the new um, John Stewart Green Lantern who took over for Al Jordan and, you know, against the backdrop of the Vietnam War and Watergate, I thought it was, again, just a chance to tell a real sort of timely tale with um, allegories to our current situation. It's interesting uh, because, uh, well, you're mixing uh, familiar characters in this case, but, but also, as you mentioned, it's part of a continuation of, of your previous work in there. And uh, did you have, uh, did you find any any trouble uh, by trying to locate it in a specific time period? Because, well, you know that uh, in comic books we have reboots every five years or every 10 years. So if you, uh, an story originally appeared in the 70s, right now it, it should be like from the 90s or something like that. Or uh, it was no problem at all? It actually felt pretty natural to me because I felt like there was a lot of parallels between what's going on in the United States now, what was going on in 1971, where you had, or rather um, 72, uh, where you had a, uh, a president who everyone sort of knew was uh, guilty of, of all kinds of corruption, but nobody could really prove it yet and about how that process goes of like about how basically about how how abusive power tends to um, undermine undermine itself and so I thought there was a lot of parallel between that and now and also about how people have to keep pretending that the Vietnam War is winnable and and that everything is going great when in fact everybody sort of understands intuitively that the war is lost and I, I feel like there's that that, that sense of public self-deception that makes that period of history very analogous to our own. All right. So uh, do we have uh, any questions from uh, Gilberto? Are you there? Yeah. Uh, it came to my attention that uh, you managed to keep uh, John Stewart not using his power ring, uh, not, uh, not using all his baggage, because uh, I want to think that uh, at that point of the history, history uh, he wasn't came along with the, all the stuff in Cosmic Odyssey, the destruction of Shanti, and all. Uh, but it, it, came, it, it really jumped uh, that it seemed to me that more than an heroic uh, comic book or an heroic uh, history, uh, you kept it very social, uh, dealing with uh, all the doubts uh, within the Huckleberry Hound and John Stewart. How easy or how difficult or how the decision came to when it came to no, not using the power ring, because it, it would, uh, some people it would seem so easy just to 
use the gimmick of the ring and try to solve the problems and try to use Huckleberry Hound very little just to question uh, the intentions of the motives of John Stewart. Yeah, well, there's a lot of comic books about superheroes just sort of using their powers based upon the assumption that they should be using their power or that they know inherently know the right way to use their power. There's not a lot of comics about people considering the implications of their power. That's what... Mm-hmm. Sorry, Mark. Well, oh, okay. Good. Sorry, Mark. Uh, we lost you uh, for a little bit. Could you repeat the, the last uh, phrases? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to be a, a meditation on power about the way it is abused and also when you should use your power and about how we all have, uh, even if we don't have a power ring, we all have a certain amount of power and about how that is ultimately the power that, that really it resonates and stays uh, the power that we get with other people. All right, in there. Uh, and uh, uh, Gilberto, do you have a follow-up uh, question in there? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, do you find uh, do you find uh, easy to relate all the social activity around the sixties, the seventies, with all the Vietnam uh, war and all that stuff? with all the things that, that are happening right now in the United States, because there are the similitudes between Nixon and your current president are quite uh, hard to miss uh, these days. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's fairly intentional. Um, yeah, I, I feel like, like there's this period of history uh, or there, there's a period of time in, in, in these eras where everybody sort of knows more than they are letting on. Like everyone is still pretending like life is normal, but secretly everybody knows that we're in a very new and dark chapter of our history. Uh, and I think part of it is, you know, the, that we, um, we don't know how to express it yet. And I, I think that this is ultimately what this comic is about, is about how, about using what limited power we have as people to um, bring down the, um, the charade of power and about how power really is really just where you believe it is. And once people start believe, believing that the uh, people over them have the power, it, it evaporates and, uh, and uh, it, it's a carefully crafted mirage by the people who hold it. And, but as long as you're, it's based on intimidation and fear, it's always... Um, illusory it's always minutes away from being shattered by because when people stop being fooled by you they tend to stop being afraid of you it's it's kind of interesting because uh, well obviously the the green lantern is one of the figures that it's associated uh, well different forces and one that you mentioned is actually the fear so uh and uh, uh, something that also struck me the most is uh, one of the pages that I was showing from the, the, the issue of the crossover with the uh, Huckleberry Hound and, and Green Lantern, where, well, uh, you have, as you mentioned before, a sort of a following uh, with Huckleberry Hound, where he's no longer a character for a kid's show, but he's actually a stand-up comedian. And then you can see how some of these, uh, these jokes, because they are criticizing uh, politics, they are not well received in some sort of publics. Obviously, if you are going to go with the military, well, you have certain parameters in there. If you are going to go with a more conservative state, with a more liberal state, obviously you have different uh, kind of uh, feelings in, in these situations. So uh, for the personality of Huckleberry Hound, did you base it, uh, in this case, in somebody else uh, that you know, perhaps in an, uh, an, uh, characteristics of a stand-up comedian, or it came uh, all from the, your interpretation of the original character? Not on a specific person that I know, but I think that there's some parallels between what's going on and that, what's going on in comics right now, uh, in that people who, are, who choose to be political um, uh, tend to be targeted by by um, alt-right fans or fans that, that um, claim to be against any sort of like partisanship or politics in comics, but are really just don't want your politics in comics. And so I feel like there's, there's some, uh, some of that at work where comic book creators and artists in general during these times of peril feel intimidated to really speak their mind because they're, they're afraid of the, the, the backlash. Uh, and in Huckleberry Hound's case, the backlash was very real. He basically 
has his career ruined because he uh, speaks out against the war during a USO military uh, tour. Um, and, and I also wanted to sort of have the interpersonal dynamic where John Stewart is just at the beginning of his career. He's a brand new Green Lantern. He's still in training. And Huckleberry Hound is at the end of his career. He has kind of, uh, because he's, he chose to speak out against injustices, he's, he's destroyed his career. And so he, in a way, sort of poses a cautionary tale for John Stewart and raises the stakes for John Stewart's own decisions that he has to make in regards to how, he's gonna, how much he's going to use his power to stop the injustices he sees around him. All right. Siko, uh, uh, do you have any questions for Mark? Oh, yeah. Uh, I like to say that the, this story for me is very well crafted because uh, it uh, joins John Stewart that appears in 1971-72, kind of, and the Nixon stuff, the Vietnam stuff, and, and all joined together to be a really good critic of the, of the moment that it was living the, the country. You know? even, even Checkers <laughs> uh, uh, embodies well done with, with Huckle, no? They both are dogs, uh, all were very well craft. Uh, for me, the question, Mark, is uh, I, I always read you and notice that you always like to, to send a message to say uh, social, to tell a social message that tells us more than, than the story itself. Notice that you, it's a... Uh, how important it is to tell that uh, the social stuff and even entertain the comic book? Well, I, I don't know. I don't really feel like I sit down and set out to tell sort of social stories, but I, I do think as writers, we tend to write about the things in the world around us that really bother us. And there they tend to be the things that sort of upset, we obsess with when we're not writing. And those tend to be the things that leak out into our, our fiction when we are writing because we're spending so much time thinking about them. So I, I think that naturally I cue towards writing about things in the world that that really are are just troubling me, and um, and it's hard to write <laughs> without writing about the, the current situation in America. And I also think that um, all good science fiction is really sort of a metaphor. It is a, it is a satire of the present, even if it's set in the future or if it's that with you know you're populated by superheroes i think it's always kind of about the subconscious of the author and the zeitgeist of the of the place in which the author lives all right uh, do you have a follow up question uh, Siko? no it's very clear <laughs> all right uh, uh, i think that is very very uh, assertive and the satire as he says is the main the main street all right yeah i think Really, you just want to talk about the world in your life in as direct and meaningful way as you can. And that, and luckily for me, that usually makes it funnier. And you can talk about something really directly and, and as, as bluntly as possible. It tends to lend itself really well to uh, humor and satire and, I think, social parable. All right. So, uh, Wookie, we're going with you to see, do you have any follow-up question about this or a different project, actually, from, from Mark? Uh, no, it's from this. Um, people like Jerry Seinfeld says that be, uh, doing stand-up is difficult these times because now everything uh, hurts a lot of people. Do you want to reflect that with Huckleberry be doing stand-up? Um, yeah, I just... I think that you ultimately have to say what you believe and and let the chips fall where they may. So I think the worst thing you could do as a writer, or as an artist, or as a comedian is worry about the people you're hurting in a way. You have to say what you think and and just sort of like let it all out. And if people are hurt by the truth, then maybe the truth ought to hurt them. I think that we just found our fifth member. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, may I? Uh, we have seen uh, through all your recent work 
the Flintstones, the Snugglepuss, and uh, Green Lantern, Huckleberry Hound, that you have become quite a social uh, voice or social writer. Uh, how has been the all the reaction from all the people around you or fans or uh, the social justice warriors in the internet? Uh, there has been a positive reaction to your work or because Flintstone was a very well done, very well rounded social uh, critic. Uh, so was the Snaggle Post from the, the minorities, uh, so to speak. And this time with Huckleberry Finn, uh, Huckleberry Hound, sorry. Uh, as you said, uh, Jonas Ward was at the beginning of his career um, as a Green Lantern. And uh, Huckleberry Hound was at the end of it, was actually uh, almost a, as a, seen as a reject from all the comedians uh, that surround him, since his peers. Um, how, how, how have been the, the reactions to all, to all these themes uh, from your fans or from the people that may not be your fans, but uh, they are uh, buying uh, all the, all the have written? Well, the reaction's been very good. I think largely because um, this is all I'm known for. So people who are my fans got in knowing what I what it is I do. But I don't have a lot of people who were fans of me that are disappointed that all of a sudden I'm being political or, you know, that I'm writing about social things because that's why I've been so uh, Obviously, I get some blowback from people who don't agree with me politically, but that's to be expected. Uh, again, I don't think they, they should have to take my feelings into consideration any more than I take theirs into consideration. We should just say what we think and let let the ideas win or lose based on their own merit. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with the reaction. I think the worst thing you can get as a writer is, uh, is indifference. Where people just sort of like think, well, that was a nice story and then instantly forget about it. So I think if you say something that resonates with people, whether it's um, something they really love or something that really bothered them and that they, you know, either way you're doing your job, you're moving people. Uh, sorry about, uh, about the small uh, pause. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the other titles that you have been writing. Uh, uh, perhaps a lot of us uh, get uh, got to know you uh, by the titles that you were publishing in DC Comics. Uh, if I remember correctly, it began with the press, and then uh, from there uh, you went to the other titles. However, uh, that's not the, the only uh, studio where you have been working, because you also have been working with a, a character that I find uh, fascinating, because uh, I believe that it's kind of hard to translate to modern times, and I am uh, talking about uh, the Lone Ranger. So how did you uh, uh, go to write about this character? It's something that uh, came to you, or it's a character that you were looking to write? A, a little bit of both. Um, Dynamite approached me about writing a title for them, and they gave me a list of the, the titles that they had the rights to. And when I saw that Lone Ranger was on the list, I immediately went for that. Uh, one, because I've always just wanted to write a Western. And, and two, because I, I felt like he's so iconic in a way that, like, the Flintstones are iconic or Snagglepuss is iconic. That it, he inspires me to write a story based upon him and the world that he's in. Where, um, and, and to me, the West has always been kind of the mythology of America. It is to us what, say, like, the stories of Hercules and Zeus are to ancient Greece. Um, something that's that is based on a little bit of fact, but more about the legend we create to tell ourselves what we want to hear about ourselves. So I thought it'd be interesting to do a Western that was more realistic, that showed us a more realistic portrait of ourselves and what it is we have been doing uh, since the 19th century. And really it's about him and Tonto trying to prevent, as you see there in the page you just shown, the resurrection of the cotton plantation as the model for American civilization, which I think is what the entire conservative movement in the last hundred years has been about. It's been about trying to model American society on the cotton plantation. Mm -hmm. And one question uh, also about this title, it's uh, um, uh, 
It's kind of interesting because uh, in the family of the characters of the Lone Ranger and also the Green Hornet, well, uh, I remember that it was like the first uh, connection between characters from the present and, and, and the, in this case of the Western times of, of the Old West. Um, but do you have any problems uh, reflecting uh, the voices of some characters like the, in this case, the owners of the plantations or uh, perhaps Tonto? Yeah, I think it's always something that you have to sort of worry about as a writer because you you don't want to just every character will sound like you. You want to make them all sort of iconic and for them to make sense. And I think also you don't want them all necessarily to reflect your opinion. I think it's what makes the story interesting is a conflict between worldviews, a conflict between perspectives. And the way to do that effectively is to sort of like give voice to perspectives you don't necessarily agree with but to make them not like sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Because it's really easy to write uh, a villain that it's just like uh, we say in Spanish, el malo de, da, de malolandia or the baddest of the baddest uh, in English. But uh, you, you have to feel, uh, if not empathy, you have to feel him as a real character, I believe. Yeah, All right. I agree. I, I, the best villains always have perspective. It may be pure evil, but you, you, you understand why they believe what they believe. It isn't just through the galaxy. And with the Lone Ranger, how big of a person is Connie character? And uh, paradoxically, uh, a character that nobody talks a lot about, there's no plan for uh, upcoming movies or television series, that it's not in, all, in a super uh, territory that's been working uh, since the last uh, the, the decade began. Uh, how big of a pressure is for you to, to write it? I actually find it kind of liberating to write a character like that because there's not many expectations. Uh, like, like the points down, which you know, had two sort of disastrous live action movies made on it and were pretty much dead as a franchise, except for you know, maybe the vitamin pills. When I took it over, it allowed me a lot of freedom to recreate it in a way that makes sense to me. I think the same is kind of true with Born Ranger. Um, the, there were no plans to do a movie or a TV show. It was sort of not a very popular franchise, but that allowed me to, to take it in, direct, in a direction that, that was meaningful to me because I didn't have to fit into a bunch of continuity or worry about a bunch of executives getting upset if I did something with it they didn't like. All right. So, uh, Siko, do you have any questions about the Lone Ranger before we go to a different title? Okay. It's the Lone Ranger. Uh, I read the first volume from Brett uh, Matthews and uh, John Cassidy for, for Dynamite Comics. It was just, uh, more like Heroic, if you can do it, it was a, a long origin story in the, the bad numbers <laughs> there. Uh, but now uh, I read your first number of issues, your first issue, and I found that the Western was alive. There was real problems. There was a land there were uh, fences put against the the natives, uh, against other uh, poor people or less with less resources. This is going to be the thematic uh, awarding in these volumes of Lord Ranger. Yes, um, it's, it really is about. Um, Civilization is the theft of land and about forcing people off of the land they've always lived on and about that being sort of the, the cardinal sin of civilization and about the Lone Ranger and Ponto having to stop the, uh, the inexorable march of civilization and about how we value the more we the more we have, the more we tend to value our possessions more than we do people which paradoxically causes them, us to value them more than we do our own lives, that, which is sort of the undoing you know, of, the, of these villains, the fact that they're so predictable because they're so invested in their property that it makes them, le it makes them less 
dangerous in a way because you always know what they're going to do and they're going to put themselves at risk to protect their property. Mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, I really like the first issue. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Wookie, do you have uh, one question about about the Lone Ranger before before we go to the Fantastic Twins? Oh, well. No, uh, but before okay. the Fantastic Twins, I want to ask about the bomb. Uh, Mark is the Kokoa. How ah. did you came with the title? Love it. <laughs> yeah, it's very fun, but creepy. It's, it's, it's great. How do you start with that? I'm sorry. Were you asking about the uh, the the, the uh, Count Chocula story? I wrote? Yes. Yeah. About that yeah. one. They've got other poems. Yeah. I'm trying to write like a uh, like a Count Chocula fan fiction story forever. I originally posted one on my Facebook, and um, I, I I've been waiting for a chance to put it in comic books. So when they let me do it uh, for a Hoy, um Snifter of Terror, the Edgar Allan Poe comic, I was I was ecstatic. I'm doing another one too about Frank. I believe that was a, a lot of fun, to write. Being able to like work in all the uh, sort of references, to all the serial breakfast serial characters, and put them in this sort of Game of Thrones world where they're they're uh, faring off against each other, like like pieces on a chessboard. That was just a uh, um, a writer's dream come true. <laughs> and it's really funny. Uh, actually, we were uh, talking about this title uh, just right before we started with the with the recording because uh, you have some references that are kind of obvious, like the ones that we are looking in, in the page. But the way that you put them is like so subtle because in the story, uh, you you buy entirely the fiction that you are reading because well, of course they are part of the same universe, and it, even some reference that you include like at the beginning. Uh, let me check if it is in, in this page. Uh, like, uh, okay, we have the, the channel just uh, outside of the castle with everything is happening. Well, it's a Cocoa channel. So it's like, yes, of course, it has to be this kind of, of reference that you have in this kind of story. <laughs> I have a hard time passing at the time. So, yeah, I, I was glad, I'm glad you caught that. I don't know how many people are going to catch that the little note was called Coco Chanel. There we have it. So uh, remember, this is actually one of the titles that we recommended in the sections of the recommendations from the Stripando. So now you have it from from the voice of the of the writer of the author of this story. So uh, let's go to actually something that it's coming. We have uh, some titles that uh, one is from Vertigo, but the one that actually uh, started making more noise in in conventions it's the one about the Wonder Twins. So. These characters are kind of hard or tough to 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 work because they they uh, actually came from a, a cartoon, a kids' cartoon, as pretty much every cartoon is. Uh, however, they, uh, they they haven't been like really successful with the mature readers. And yes, I am using uh, quotes in case that you are only listening to the audio of this. So, uh, what's the appeal that you find in these kind of characters, or what's like the the, the perspective that that uh, uh, that, that you can tell us uh, that you are going to bring to these uh, old-fashioned kid characters? Well, I was really excited to be offered the Wonder Twins um, and this uh, specifically to write it. And I said yes before I even finished asking because, uh, one, I uh, grew up on Super Friends, so I loved the Super Friends when I was a kid and the Wonder Twins. And, and two, I think that it's exciting to write characters with very limited very specific superhero powers because uh, that, that helps. That's why, as a writer, it's good to have these limitations because it limits the amount of the ways you can go with it. And also, I wanted, I'm always attracted to being able to write about a time and place from the perspective of an outsider. Like, the, the only one who really understood America was the Pope Guild or else. Uh, I think, in a similar way, like the Wonder Twins come here from the planet Exor, they'll have really uh, sort of Good observations about the church that we don't, we can't, that most people won't have because we're all sort of immersed in it. Uh, so it gave me a chance to sort of like use them sort of in the way that I use the Great Gazoo and the Flintstone comic, which are an outsider coming in and realizing just how, how messed up everything is. I see. So, uh, any questions about this title, guys? Uh, Gilberto? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not the it's not the first time that the DC has been trying to introduce to the main continuity, so to speak, uh, the Wonder Twins. 
Uh, first, we saw a very bad, dumb, creepy kind of what the hell in Extreme Justice, uh, the beginning of the 90s. Then the last time we saw them was in Jump Justice, that was uh, the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, the reactions has been a lot of hate relationships because people are quite fond uh, of the cartoons, where they came from. And uh, they hate the, all the comic book appearances. Uh, there are this, the stories you're going to try to, um, not write, that you're going to write. Uh, in its title, are going to be sort of their own, as you said, trying to understand America, trying to understand the world, the, the superhero world that they are, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, how, to, how to get involved with it. Or are you trying to get another uh, another kind of stories, nothing to get related with what uh, Snyder is doing on the Justice League or Abnet is doing on Titans, that they are like an amalgam of the same story? Well, the, um, the underlying will be in DC continuity, so that is one thing I have to be cognizant of. DC continuity, and I can't um, violate storylines that are happening in the other comics. But I'm not really writing this in conjunction with the other Wonder titles. And I think one of the mistakes that, that previous iterations of the Wonder Twins and comics have made is that they try to take these sort of these kids who are on their face kind of a little ridiculous and make them sort of these badass superheroes. Whereas what I want to kind of do is the opposite. I want to take this badass superhero world and put it in the world of these sort of kind of ridiculous kids. Uh, I want to do it the opposite way and, and have the world be sort of like more goofy like you would expect from the Super Friends cartoon than from what you know you'd expect from you know, the, uh, the other sort of DC lines. So I wanted to be, I wanted to not be seamless with the other lines and not violate them, but at the same time, I wanted to be something completely different. Okay, so it, it's going to be in the same uh, world, but in, in same continuity, but in a, like I say, in a different room. Yeah, exactly. A, a completely different perspective. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, more questions about the Wonder Twins, uh, Siko, Wookie? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's go with Gookie. Okay, uh, Glick is still the comical relief, like in the cartoons, or be different? Yeah, be different. Um, Gleek, uh does appear. He um, turns out like that man is reading a comic book, and he sees an ad for uh, for um, circus monkeys. Uh, you can buy old discarded circus monkeys for you know ten bucks or whatever. So he sends away and gets like the circus monkey that turns out to be Gleek. And and Gleek, you know, saves them uh, by you know doing tricks and stuff that he learned in the circus, and you know they're treating it like oh Gleek, you know you saved the day, you know. But meanwhile, Gleek is replaying these horrible memories in his head about the, the, them training him in the circus and abusing him to like get him to learn how to do these tricks. So it's a lot about how the the, the sort of sad exploitation that lies underneath. The, the training of superheroes and that's, that's maybe giving away more than I should but um, yeah it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very sort of dark very sweet comic clip <laughs> thanks that sounds very interesting creepy but cool creepy <laughs> <laughs> well, at the same time <laughs> it's funny how often those two intersect <laughs> excellent all right, uh, one question from you, uh, Siko, before we go from, to the questions from the audience. Yeah. I, I was going to, well, I, I want to, to ask you, how you, do you deal with the cheesy powers of the twins? But with the explanation of Glick, I, I know that I will get something special from you. Yeah, the, the thing that I always, I always kind of like was fascinated by the Wonder Twins is that they work in the Hall of Justice, where you've got Superman, you know, the most powerful being in the world, and then you've got Batman, the world's greatest detective, and then you basically have a guy who can turn into steam. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so huge influence on the other superheroes, uh, and and like Jane is hardly much better. She just turned. so, but it, it, but it forces you. How could you possibly combine these powers? 
in a way that that works together. So in a lot of ways, it's, I think it opens up a lot more opportunities for sort of funny and interesting resolutions than if you just have a guy who can, you know, melt steel with his eyes and and fly through the wall and arrest everybody. That uh, maybe San is uh, could be Aquaman's best friend. <laughs> yeah. There is, I'm not. This isn't too much of a spoiler uh, because <laughs> I have, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But uh, Zan ends up making the hockey team of the school largely because of his ability to turn into a fresh coat of ice on the skating <laughs> rink. <laughs> All right, so that's actually a, a clever way of um, of uh, not not reinventing but but using the characters. And uh, we have some questions from the audience. Thanks to Rodrigo Diaz and to Carolina. Uh, they are actually both of our patrons in, in this project that we have. And we have some interesting questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Carol says that. Um, let me read it in here. Um, why has decided DC to bring back these old characters uh, because she thinks that they were well mostly forgotten and it's something that uh, that we're actually talking about well I think that was mostly Brian Michael Bendis' decision because he wanted to do a wonder line that would speak to sort of teenage readers uh, younger readers and, and get them into comics and superheroes that were more relatable to them And the Wonder Twins were just one of the titles he thought would be really resonant with with younger readers, which I wholeheartedly agree with. I think that it's, it's anything you can do to get younger readers reading comic books and, and sort of meaningful stories, I think, is a good thing. Get them thinking about the world around them. All right, and uh, we have an, another question that it's actually a little bit in line with, uh, in, in, with the characters at least from Rodrigo Diaz, and he asks, uh, he is wondering if you have any plan to bring uh, at least in, 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 the bra in, in the background characters like uh, uh, Apache Chief or uh, Black Vulcan, uh, some of the old super friends. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a lot of them in there, and the, the ones that were Hanna-Barbera that weren't also DC, they made me take out. Yeah, I had like... Um, Uh, Black Vulcan in one. They maybe replaced him with Black Lightning uh, because he was Hanna Barbera and not in DC. And, um, and yeah, I had Samurai in one, and they, they I had to take him out and put in somebody else. Uh, but but yeah, I I, I wanted to specifically to use like um, as many of the the minor Super Friends characters who would just show up and you know tell you to brush your teeth or would just give like health tips. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to use as many of those as possible, but unfortunately, I can only use the ones that are that exist both in the DC and Hanna-Barbera world. <laughs> just, just one question. Uh, do you have any plans to make a crossover? Do you see those, these characters crossing with the new Young Justice title that's about to come? Um, I have no plans to, to cross over with Young Justice, but I'm excited for Young Justice. And, you know, maybe if, if once we get past the initial six issue story arc, I would be open to doing some sort of crossover with Young Justice. I think that would be great. Yeah. They are from the same line, no? Yeah, right. Yeah, same line. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got the first six issues pretty tightly mapped out, but after that, anything goes. Uh, I, I wouldn't surprise me if we crossed over with, with one or more of the other Wonder titles. That would be pretty cool. All right, and we will be uh, really looking forward to, to read it. And as Carolina mentioned, perha perhaps there were some characters that were sort of forgotten, but actually we perhaps we thought the same about some of the other characters that you have uh, brought to life with uh, a new light. Uh, I am still uh, waiting uh, for some of the characters to be named as Leon Melquiades. I, I don't know if you remember that that was the name of, <laughs> of Snagglepuss in Spanish. So I, I am still waiting for some ca character name like that. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't told him the, the Morocco Topo and the Inspector Ardilla, no? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that's correct. So perhaps we, we can make uh, some trivia time later about that. So uh, we're pretty much uh, about to finish this transmission. So in case that people wants to want to to check uh, any more, uh, more more information about your titles they they can well obviously go to the to the closest comic book uh, shop to to buy some of these uh, rodrigo diaz actually mentioned that he used bought the two three paperbacks of the flintstones so uh, there there you have it that's the best way to to read it but they also can find you in uh, social networks uh, like twitter is that correct that's correct yeah anyone wants to Follow me on Twitter. Uh, they can do so at Manrest. That's probably up 
updates on comics I'm writing or things I'm doing. I, I pretty much put it all on Twitter. All right, so I was just uh, waiting for this to load. And sorry, I, I have to comment about this, but I just love the description that actually you added in your uh, on your bio. I know that you have uh, have uh, changed it uh, from time to time, but it's like Eisner lost in comic book writer. So I, you actually took it with uh, with uh, a great sense of humor uh, behind the Flintstone, Snagglepuss, the, the Lone Ranger, and Comic Soup, the Wonder Twins. So there you have it in twittercom slash Ross. They can find you and perhaps uh, send some some comments and good vibes to 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 you, Mark. <laughs> I look forward to it. All right. And uh, well, uh, thank you very much to uh, all of you who have been watching uh, this transmission. Thank, thank you to Rodrigo. Thanks to uh, Caro and to everybody who is going to watch this uh, afterwards. Uh, remember, remember that we will uh, also have the audio downloadable version probably uh, tomorrow morning. And especially thanks to you, Mark. It was a real pleasure to, to have the chance to talk again with you. For me as well. Thank you. All right, and remember, uh, guys, that if you want to support this and uh, other projects, uh, we have actually a Patreon page, uh, which is located in patreon.com slash thestrippando, uh, and you can follow us in, in, in social networks, such as uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, just uh, look for the strip Pando, letter D, strip, uh, A-N-D-O. And that's all for us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being uh, here with, uh, with us. And once again, thanks, Mark. And thank thanks, you. everybody. Bye.